like to thank all the attendees that are still online after such a long uh, day. So uh, the session is on sleep medicine and chronic respiratory failure. And uh, I'm very happy to present my friend Refika Ersu. She is from uh, uh, Turkey, but uh, uh, she's living since, since uh, several years in Canada. And which is the time now in Canada, Refika? Uh, one and a half years. <laughs> what time is it now? Oh, what time is it? Oh, sorry. It's, uh, it's actually only like 10 to 11. So it's the morning. So we are ready to go for dinner and you are uh, ready to go for lunch. <laughs> exactly. We have decided together with Refika that we, she will uh, give the two presentations and we'll uh, uh, have 15 minutes of discussion on both the presentation. Okay, go ahead. All right, thanks Fabio. Well, I'll, uh, wait, while I'm waiting for my slides, I also so want to- slide, you should have control. You should okay. just need to click on the screen and move the slide. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, so today we'll talk about sleep-related breathing disorders in children. I have no conflict of interest uh, regarding to this presentation. And the American Academy of, Pedi uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine describes the uh, sleep-related breathing disorders under obstructive and central apnea and sleep-related hypoventilation and hypoxemia, as well as isolated symptoms uh, such as snoring. Today we'll talk about obstructive sleep ap apnea only uh, and we'll first uh, start with the definition. So it's a syndrome of upper airway dysfunction during sleep and it's characterized by snoring and or increased respiratory effort and results from increased upper airway resistance and pharyngeal collapsibility. When we look at the pathophysiology, this is a rather simplistic, uh, very simplistic uh, definition because now, uh, in, especially in the adult world, we are talking about phenotypes and endotypes of obstructive sleep apnea. But when we look at it in children, the main reason for uh, upper airway obstruction is the anatomic um, narrowing of the upper airway. And in otherwise normal children, it's usually by adenofascular hypertrophy. But in children with Down syndrome or other craniofacial anomalies, you can also have mid face hypoplasia other, uh, or other causes that may cause uh, upper airway obstruction. Uh, normal uh, upper airway muscle tonus is also important to keep our uh, airways open. So if there's abnormal uh, muscle tonus, such as uh, it's present in children with neuromuscular disease or cerebral palsy, that also puts children at risk for obstructive sleep apnea. There are some other factors that contribute. There is a heritability of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and in children, there is usually a family history of snoring and or adenotonsillectomy. Passive smoke exposure is a very significant risk factor such, uh, and uh, also allergic rhinitis. There is a strong relationship with asthma and obesity. Premature children are also at risk for obstructive sleep apnea because of anatomical reasons and poverty uh, is a significant risk factor. Uh, well, is it a significant problem? It's quite prevalent uh, and children snore uh, quite a bit, 7% uh, of normal population. Not every child with snoring have obstructive sleep apnea. So the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in general population is one to four, but it's much higher in risk uh, groups such as Down syndrome or children with obesity. And it is significant because it's uh, related, it's associated with complications such as neurobehavioral problems, learning deficits, growth retardation, cardiovascular complications such as high blood pressure, and in severe cases, even pulmonary hypertension. There are also metabolic consequences, especially in obese children who have obstructive sleep apnea and also aneurysis. So all these problems may actually cause significant morbidity and quality of life issues. With the uh, European Respiratory uh, Society Task Force, we have developed a couple papers, uh, which are published both in the European Respiratory Society uh, Journal, ERJ, and also Pediatric Pulmonology. So the first of those papers looked at how we can recognize a child with obstructive sleep apnea. So children may have symptoms directly related to upper airway obstruction, such as snoring, apneas, difficulty breathing, mouth breathing. Uh, 
or they may have uh, symptoms and signs of obstructive sleep apnea related morbidity we just talked about, such as elevated blood pressure, enuresis, daytime sleepiness, inattention, hyperactivity, cognitive deficits. And we all then look at those children, whether they have any signs uh, of uh, obstructive sleep apnea risk factors, such as nasal septum deviation, adult ulcer hypertrophy, obesity, and uh, maxillary or mandibular uh, hypoplasia, neuromuscular weakness. And if you see a child with complex disorder, such as a chondroplasia or query malformation, Down syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome, we should always think about obstructive sleep apnea because these are the children who are at increased risk, who have more uh, severe disease uh, and also need more uh, therapy to improve their quality of life. So when we look at how we can recognize the child, we have a child who either have parental reported symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, such as snoring apneas, or a clinic visit that you realize may be associated with obstructive sleep apnea, such as you see a child with uh, hyperactivity in attention or high blood pressure. Then you evaluate the patient uh, for the risk factors we just reviewed, uh, but then you still need an objective testing to make a diagnosis. So the objective testing can be polysomnography, especially if the child is obese, if, have, if uh, the child has craniofacial abnormalities or other complex conditions. It can be a home-based polygraphy or nocturnal oximetry, which are quite viable options, especially uh, in resource-limited settings. You can always use a pediatric as sleep questionnaire, either in addition to those methods or just in uh, itself, because sometimes it's hard to get uh, more objective testing other than uh, a questionnaire. So when we look at those tests, uh, the first one being a questionnaire, uh, until this pediatric sleep questionnaire, we didn't have a good um, sample, uh, a good tool to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, but pediatric sleep questionnaire have, has proved to be very useful with a good sensitivity and a specificity. It may not be perfect in an individual patient, but if you are um, in a limited uh, resource setting, this is a useful tool in addition to the clinical questions and exam examination. It also can be used in addition to the more objective tools such as oximetry or polygraphy or pulsomography because it does look at the other uh, adenotonsinectomy responsive, uh, responsive um, questions such as uh, daytime symptoms, daytime sleepiness, hyperactivity in attention. Pulse oximetry is also very useful because it's widely available. And if you use a pulse oximetry uh, with a recording, it can be very helpful in children with obstructive symptoms. Because in children older than one year of age and who do not have an obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, nocturnal desaturations less than 90%, more than two clusters of desaturation events, and oxygen desaturation index uh, greater than 2.2% episodes per hour are very unusual. So if you see three clusters of desaturation events on an overnight oximeter recording, and there are at least three desaturation events led to less than 90%, it's quite a good measure of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. However, uh, although it's very specific, it's not very sensitive. So if it's not conclusive, uh, so if you do not find those results, the child may still have obstructive sleep apnea, but uh, maybe just not associated with a lot of desaturations. So the test to determine diagnosis and severity of, of obstructive sleep apnea is polysomnography, which is derived from a Greek word using lots of graphics during sleep. So they, uh, during polysomnography, which we'll talk a little bit more in detail at tomorrow's workshop, we use EEG, EOG, and CHIN EMG to uh, define the sleep states and arousals. So we have a measure of sleep fragmentation. 
Um, we look at the airflow uh, for apneas. Uh, we have a chest and abdominal valves. So look at respiratory effort. So if there's an apnea, so there's no flow, we can determine whether it's uh, obstructive or central. We also have an oximetry to look at the saturations. And in children, it's also recommended to measure nasal entire CO2 or transcutaneous CO2 to define obstructive uh, hypoventilation. There are also technicians who are watching the kid and commenting on the events uh, with the video recording. So obstructive sleep apnea diagnosis based on the American Academy of Sleep Medicine definition requires polysomnography. Uh, if there's a presence of either snoring or labored paradoxical or obstructive breathing during the child's sleep or sleepiness, hyperactivity, behavioral problems in a child and uh, uh, overnight polysomnography shows one or more obstructive events or obstructive hypoventilation, then this is a child uh, who has both the symptom and the objective monitoring method that shows obstructive sleep apnea. And when you have a polysomnography, one of the advantages is that you can grade the severity of the obstructive sleep apnea. If your obstructive apnea hypopnea index one to five, it's mild, five to 10, moderate, and uh, greater than 10, it's severe obstructive sleep apnea. Do we need a polysomnography? Uh, yes, because 7% snore, uh, and we need to differentiate patients who have obstructive sleep apnea. And we know clinical info and exam are poor predictors. Most of the societies, including European Respiratory Society, do recommend polysomnography. And it can help to predict perioperative risk and cure rate. If it's very severe, then uh, the cure rate may be a little bit less. Uh, but still, it's not the perfect tool to look at the, both the perioperative risk and uh, the cure rate. Primary snoring may also have some adverse outcomes on children's health, such as higher blood pressures, academic difficulties. And uh, based on those, ENT, the ear nose throat doctor guidelines, uh, the society guidelines actually recommend polysomnography only in younger children who have syndromes and if the exam is not consistent with symptoms. So the jury is still out there, whether we need a polysomnography for every child, especially when we have such limited resources. How about home sleep studies? So we do not have EEGs. EMG uh, and EOGs to look at arousals and sleep states, but we have airflow and belts and an oximetry. We can look at the respiratory events. There are advantages, uh, there have many advantages because they're portable, comfortable, cheaper, therefore require less resources and more accessible, and may actually represent a more typical night for sleep uh, because the child is in his or her own environment, therefore contain a longer REM sleep, which is uh, the sleep state where we see the most of the obstructive events in children. Well, we cannot determine the total sleep time uh, and arousal, so, uh, so we cannot decide whether the child had a good night's sleep, whether he had sleep fragmentation. It may both under or overestimate the amount of sleep disorder breathing, and they usually do not use um, and tidal CO2 or transcutaneous CO2, therefore we cannot determine hypoventilation. And because we don't have a technician watching over the child, there may be some study failures. That, what did the ERS recommend for uh, treatment for children with obstructive sleep apnea? Well, if we have an of polysomnography available, if the obstructive apnea hypopnea index is greater than five, then uh, we recommend the treatment for children. And we recommended that treatment can be beneficial if the obstructive sleep apnea is mild. So the uh, obstructive apnea hypopnea index is one to five. If there is morbidity from cardiovascular, central nervous system, or you know, bad quality of life. But what if we didn't have polysomnography or even polygraphy? Then we recommended treatment if uh, oximetry is positive or sleep questionnaire, sleep disorder breathing questionnaire is positive. Or if you don't have the objective tools, but the child has morbidity, then treatment is justified. 
So because adenotonsillar hypertrophy is the most common cause of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, adenotonsillectomy uh, remains as the primary treatment. Uh, there is one uh, study which is now uh, some years uh, old, which compared the adenotonsillectomy in children with obstructive sleep apnea with watchful waiting in a, um, this, so this was a randomized trial, and they, their main outcome was neurocognition, which was similar in both groups, so the adenotonsillectomy was not very helpful in uh, neurocognition, but it was very helpful in improving behavior, quality of life, plus somnography, and there was also a greater reduction in symptoms. However, to uh, some surprise, the uh, results show that the watchful waiting group also had some improvement. So 46% in the watchful waiting group also improved in their symptoms and their uh, plus somnography results. However, there was, of course, a greater improvement in the adult translectomy group. So which children did not improve was the children who were obese. So this is the early adenotonsillectomy group, uh, and this is a watchful waiting group. So children who were not obese improved more. Children who had less severe disease, so less uh, apnea hypopnea index improved more. And children who were uh, not African-American uh, descendants uh, improved more as well. So all the studies showed quite similar results. Uh, if you have a child who is older, who is obese, who has asthma, with more severe obstructive apnea, male, African-American, and uh, children with syndromes are less likely to improve after adenotonsillectomy. What other options we have is one of them is weight loss, which is not very easy to achieve, but if it is achieved in an intensive inpatient treatment program, there is an improvement in sleep disorder breathing by 80%. Other, uh, another way to improve um, weight loss is, of course, a bariatric surgery. And uh, this, children, this uh, study in adolescents showed that who, children who had obstructive sleep apnea at baseline showed resolution at one year follow-up after bariatric surgery. So those are, of course, not easy options, but prove to be very important. So weight loss is one of the treatment options. How about anti-inflammatory treatment? Obstructive sleep apnea is an inflammatory state, and there are increased glucocorticoid receptor expression and increased uh, leukotrienes also in adenotonsillar tissue uh, in children with obstructive sleep apnea, and nasal steroid use showed in decrease in volume of adenoids with uh, suppression of inflammation and improvement in obstructive apnea, hypopnea index in children moderate to, uh, mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. However, uh, you need to stop uh, nasal steroid at some point, and there have been some recurrences reported. So these children need to be followed carefully. Uh, another anti-inflammatory treatment option was Montelukas because these children showed increased cystine leukotrienes, uh, both in their adenotonsillar tissue and in their uh, systems in urine uh, and, um, and sputum. So they, there were two randomized controlled trials, trials looking at uh, effectiveness of Montelukas in children with mild to moderate obstructive apnea. Both showed decrease in apnea hypopnea index in, in children who use Montelukas compared to placebo. And the other one also showed a very similar result. There is a black box warning by FDA now for Montelukas because of behavioral side effects. So that remains to be uh, seen whether uh, we can continue to use that in children with obstructive sleep apnea, but that seems to be an option. Of course, in adults, the main treatment uh, modality is positive airway pressure therapy for obstructive sleep apnea, which also remains a viable option for children with residual obstructive sleep apnea after adenotonsillectomy, or if the ob obstructive apnea is related to obesity, craniofacial abnormalities, or neuromuscular disease. If there is a nocturnal hypoventilation accompanying obstructive sleep apnea, then non invasive ventilation with a BiPAP is preferred. It does improve gas exchange, attention deficit, slippiness, behavior uh, of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. There are some minor complications that need to be taken care of because this is an ongoing therapy. And we can monitor the adherence with a monitoring device in the software. Uh, and management of complications definitely increase adherence. 
we, we should never be discouraged about CPAP adherence. This study just shows if the child, children have developmental disability, they actually have better adherence than uh, children otherwise who are normal. And the adherence improve over time at three and six months. So we should always think that CPAP therapy can be tolerated uh, with a good uh, support in place. The last uh, option that I will mention, I will not talk about uh, tracheostomy, is rapid maxillary expansion. So this is the orthodontic therapy that can actually help to improve the airway uh, dimensions. So the meta-analysis in uh, 314 children show that apnea hypopnea index indeed improves with uh, rapid maxillary expansion. And this effect uh, actually lasts uh, over than more than uh, for, more, for more than three years. So this is actually a very viable option for children who have orthodontic treatments. So I will, um, before I will go to the newer uh, sort of uh, developments in a couple of slides, I will just summarize that we have recommended in the European Respiratory Task Force, Respiratory Society Task Force, that we should approach a step, uh, approach the treatment with children uh, for children with obstructive sleep apnea in a stepwise fashion. So weight loss, nasal steroids, and tonsillectomy, uh, and orthodontic treatments followed by CPAP and more invasive procedures. But we should also always keep in mind that we should individualize and sometimes combine these treatments. And I think that's where the future lies. And in a couple of slides, I will just finish my talk that there are some new developments one of them is, of course, our dream uh, diagnosis of, of uh, say, with a smartphone. So there have been some developments. This was an older study, but a newer study showed that with a cloud algorithm-driven oximetry-based diagnosis, especially if the child has an apnea hypopnea index of greater than 10, so which is severe, you have a very good diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and then there are also some developments with a lot of recent studies looking at the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, looking at where the obstruction is and how severe it is. So this way you can improve the treatment outcomes. You can do this for children who have residual obstructive sleep apnea or children who are surgically naive. So this study was uh, in children who were surgically naive and showed a 91% success in those children who were treated with obstructive, with adenotonsillectomy if this treatment was done after dice. And the non-surgical treatment was proposed for 11%. Heated high flow uh, nasal cannula oxygenation is very popular, especially for children who have bronchiolitis. And it has been used now in several studies in children who have CPAP intolerant, who are CPAP intolerant and who have obstructive sleep apnea and showed, as you can see here, great improvements in obstructive apnea hypopnea index. Hypoglossal nerve stimulation has been, has been approved for adults since 2014. It uh, trusts uh, with the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, you have a trust of the tongue anteriorly opening up the airway and it has been now tried in adolescents with Down syndrome and has shown that uh, it improved the obstructive sleep apnea uh, by 85% from baseline and children had a great uh, adherence with 9.2% per night. So those are the developments and I'd like to conclude saying that obstructive sleep apnea is common in children and associated with significant morbidity. Although polysomnography is the main diagnostic, ma diagnostic method, there are some alternatives, especially in low resource settings, and that's the whole world. Cheaper and more accessible, but also reliable methods of diagnosis are definitely needed. And using methods such as DICE uh, may increase the treatment success. Main treatment modality remains adenotonsillectomy, but treatment should be individualized and maybe combined. And although PAP therapy may be challenging in children, it's definitely possible and very helpful. And alternative diagnostic and treatment modalities are emerging. Okay, so we'll go to a couple of questions and I have, I'll spend a little bit less time on uh, home ventilation. So we'll have hopefully time for questions. So a five-year-old boy presents with a history of snoring and observed apneas for, last, for the last six months. 
which of the following is not essential in evaluation of this patient? To ask about increased activity and problems with school performance, to ask whether the patient has nocturnal enuresis, to ask whether the child has any neurobehavioral issues, to perform ear and nose throat exam, or to perform chest x-ray. I think this was an easy question. So can we go to the results, Amy? Okay, perfect. Uh, so enuresis is one of the complications uh, of obstructive sleep apnea. So we need to ask about that. So, uh, oops, sorry. So which of the following is true for overnight uh, oximeter study for diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea in children? It's reliable for diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea in children less than one year of age. It has a sensitivity, it has a high sensitivity, i.e. negative test rules out obstructive sleep apnea. So we are looking for the true answer. Oxyhemoglobin desaturation index greater than 2.2 episodes is uncommon in children without obstructive sleep apnea. Its use is not recommended to facilitate diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea if pulse somnography is not available. Even children with clusters of desaturation events, uh, even children with uh, clusters of desaturation events have low, low risk of major respiratory complications following adenotonsillectomy. So do we have enough time, Amy? Uh, yes. I mean, I think that we can see okay, the results of the voting. OK. So, um, so that was the correct answer. I will go to the last question. Which of the following is an advantage of polygraphy for diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea in children? It can accurately determine total sleep time. It requires less resources and is more comfortable. Polygraphy usually determines the presence of hypoventilation. Arousals can be scored with, with polygraphy. It always overestimates apnea hypopnea index. I think this is also rather easy. So Amy, can we, Melanie, or can we go to the results, please? Yes, perfect. So it, does not usually use uh, transcutaneous or antagonist CO2, and we cannot score arousals because we don't have EEG, EMG, or EOG. Okay, so now uh, we'll go to chronic respiratory failure, and again, have no conflict of interest. So, um, in a, respiratory failure is defined as inadequate gas exchange due to uh, pulmonary or non pulmonary causes leading to hypoxemia, hypercarbia, or both. Uh, today, we'll not talk about hypoxic respiratory failure uh, treated with oxygen, but uh, we'll uh, concentrate on uh, more um, ventilation, invasive and non-invasive. So uh, Vesilius was a, a Flemish uh, physician and anatomist who said that uh, life can be restored to an animal uh, through um, an opening uh, in the trachea and you can blow air into the lung. Non-invasive ventilation is, uh, rather came rather later in 19, um, the beginning of the 1900s. And uh, initially it was positive uh, pressure ventilation, then went to negative pressure ventilation with iron lung for polio epidemic, during polio epidemic. And then again, we have change gears to more positive airway uh, pressure ventilation with the advancement of technology in this area. And in uh, 2000s, pediatric non-invasive ventilation started. Uh, so what kind of uh, diseases we need the ventilation is usually when, uh, is when we have a uh, disequilibrium in the respiratory balance. So when the respiratory load uh, exceeds the central drive and respiratory muscle performance, uh, such in the cases with uh, anatomical abnormalities of the upper airway, you just heard about this morning, or uh, lower airway obstruction, such as cystic fibrosis, BPD, bronchitis obliterans. Uh, 
And uh, we can also have decrease in muscle performance, uh, which causes, again, a respiratory failure, uh, such as neuromuscular diseases, spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne's, or we can have a dysfunction of central drive causing respiratory failure. It can be primary in cases of congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, which is quite rare, but uh, very important. Or it can be secondary because of brain injury or uh, brainstem dysfunction, such as Chiari malformation. So these are the patients that we think about long-term uh, ventilation, either invasive or non-invasive. So uh, recent, uh, rec in recent years, uh, the number of children who are uh, ventilated long-term increased. And the study from Canada shows how, it, how much it increased over the years. And there are many studies around the world which um, actually contributes to this literature, shows similar trend. So the dark is the invasive ventilation. So every year there are more and more patients adding up to the chronic ventilation program in the center. And the uh, other uh, column with the non-invasive ventilation increasing even more. And you can see that over the years, we have more patients with non-invasive ventilation than uh, compared to invasive ventilation. Of course, for obvious reasons, family-centered care, increased morbidity and mortality. So for invasive ventilation, we usually start in a patient who has been intubated in the ICU and there are failed attempts. There is not a universal definition of how long a chronic, uh, chronic respiratory failure um, is, how, after how long of intubation chronic respiratory failure is defined. We usually accept around three to four weeks, but this really depends on the context and the underlying disease. When we decide about um, discharging, a uh, discharging a patient who is invasively ventilated, we need to make sure this child is medically stable for discharge. Family caregivers demonstrate willingness and ability to care for the patient. There is a medical equipment company who can support the needs at home. Uh, and if, we, if the family needs professional uh, in-home caregivers, such as nurses, which is not available in a lot of places in the world, then these are arranged, these arrangements are made. And we also need to make sure the home and the community environment is safe uh, and allow access to routine and urgent care of these patients. Of course, this is only true if the patient is not palliative. So if the patient is in palliative care, then it's more support at home. We use tracheostomy tubes that are a bit different than we use in the hospital. We usually use the smallest uh, tracheostomy tube that allows adequate ventilation and oxygenation. We prefer uncuffed tubes, uh, and we usually try to use the speaking valves to help the child, however young uh, the child is, to help vocalization. Uh, there are many equipments that are needed for an invasive ventilation and trachea child who is invasively ventilated with a tracheostomy at home, including ventilator, backup ventilator, uh, and also uh, emergency devices such as ambu bags and uh, emergency oxygen. One of the things that has been uh, recommended by the American uh, Academy of uh, American Thoracic uh, Society is the pulse oximetry at home for monitoring, uh, when, especially when the child is sleeping and when, is not, when the child is not uh, monitored by a caregiver. It's a long process when you have a child who needs a chronic ventilation in the ICU to discharge. And uh, this publication actually summarizes quite nicely and they have done this nice roadmap for a child uh, who has not been um, who has not been uh, successfully decannulated and who's on now uh, mechanical ventilation. And some of the key elements here is that early pulmonary and ENT consultation. And then once the, after the first track change, changing the patient to a portable ventilator and transition out of the ICU and uh, to be able to do all the training for these patients until the discharge. When they're at home, it's uh, advised by the American Thoracic Society document that there's an awake and attentive trained caregiver at home all times with this child. And there are at least two of those people in the house. 
there's an there should be an ongoing education of the caregivers and as just mentioned monitoring especially when the child is asleep or unobserved with a pulse oximeter rather than just use of a cardiorespiratory monitor or the ventilator alarms is highly recommended regular maintenance of the equipment is important uh, and they also recommended a cough assist especially if the children are not able to produce an, in, uh, an effective cough because um, the plugging of the tracheostomy is a major, major uh, cause of morbidity and even mortality. So all these tasks seem to be a very important task and hard to come over, both on the healthcare, resources, expense. But once you have a child at home who has a tracheostomy, especially if they're able to come off the ventilator during the daytime. This is a child I followed who had a uh, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome. It has a big, big effect on the quality of life of the child and of course on the parents as well. So we usually follow those children uh, one to three months after discharge and then every six months we evaluate the tracheostomy and they usually uh, may have feeding tubes. Uh, and we evaluate oxygenation, ventilation, usually with sleep studies. Sometimes they are able to wean if the child is tolerating tracheostomy color while awake, and if the underlying disease allows the child to be weaned, so the child, for example, does not have a central control problem, then we usually follow them either, uh, we usually monitor them either at the ward with a uh, cardio uh, respiratory monitoring with anti-dose CO2 and uh, oxygen monitorization, monitorization or uh, during a sleep study and then decide whether we can wean the child from the ventilator. When we look at the survival, it's about 80% after five years. Uh, however, the liberation, of from, uh, the liberation from ventilator is very low by uh, 24%. Children usually who have a bron a severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia and chronic lung disease of infancy are more likely to come off the ventilators. When we look at the non-invasive ventilation, uh, non-invasive ventilation can be started either if the child is weaned, um, extubated, but is not able to wean from positive airway pressure ventilation, or we can start it in, a, in the ward in a child who is admitted, or we can start it in a sleep lab. There are a few relative uh, contraindications, um, and one of them being the needing the ventilation for more than 16 hours, because if you have a mask on your face for more than 16 hours, that's not really helpful for the quality of life, but I did have some patients who use it for longer periods. If you have a lot of oral secretions, if you have uncontrollable uh, controllable, uh, reflux, that are, uh, these are also among some relative contraindication as well as bubble dysfunction. There are different masks that are available and I started this in um, late 1900 and now we have a vast uh, choice of masks. We usually uh, prefer nasal masks for non-invasive ventilation because it's more comfortable and it decreases it um, if you use an oral nasal, uh, oral nasal mask, then you have a risk of uh, aspiration. And especially if the child is not able to remove the mask, such as uh, in cases with severe developmental delays or neuromuscular diseases, it can present a major um, risk. So we usually like nasal masks, but sometimes it's not possible, especially if you have large mouth leaks and we go for oral nasal masks and just, you know, think about the possible risks. The total face mask is used uh, in, usually in the ICU. Nasal pillows are usually used with the CPAP for obstructive sleep apnea. And mouthpiece ventilation is used uh, during wakefulness. So there are, of course, there's a CPAP that we use for obstructive sleep apnea, and we can use different modes, spontaneous, spontaneous timed, or timed uh, modes. So IPAP, is the inspiratory positive airway pressure, which provides pressure support, increasing tidal volume, increasing minute ventilation, decreasing work of breathing, decreases the amount of CO2, and increases oxygenation. EPAP opens up the airway, so this is the expiratory positive airway pressure, uh, and also increases FRC. When we look at the parameters that we set on uh, positive airway pressure, we set the mode, 
the modes that we just talked about. But now we also have newer modes, uh, and one of them is called volume assured pressure support. So you can uh, dial in the volume that you want the, your patient to receive and a range of pressure so that that doesn't cause a pressure injury, but still deliver uh, volume that's needed uh, with maybe sometimes a little bit less pressure, sometimes with a little bit more pressure. Uh, then you dial the IPAP and EPAP uh, and the rate if you're not using spontaneous modes. We dial in the inspiratory time, uh, rise time. So rise time is important sometimes to increase the comfort of the patient. This is how long it takes for the patient to receive the inspiratory pressure. Uh, and we dial in the cycle or trigger for um, sensitivity. And we also put ramp, especially in the beginning, ramp is very helpful uh, to improve the acclimatization because ramp is, uh, to, is how much time you need to increase the pressure. If you increase the pressure over time, it's more comfortable for the patient. This is just an example how we initially set up the uh, non-invasive ventilation. So we usually like the spontaneous time mode first uh, as an initial uh, mode because that gives patients some comfort. He can still or she can still take her uh, spontaneous breaths. And IPAP and EPAP usually started at the lower pressures, eight over four usually, and try to maintain the differential of four. Of course, this is not true for patients who say just got extubated and you need to support the patient maybe with high pressures, but this is uh, usually true for patients so that you're starting either in a sleep lab or in the ward or even sometimes at home. Uh, and we usually set the bre uh, breathing rate uh, two to four breaths below patient's own spontaneous rate. So it's comfortable for the patient uh, and we decide about the others as well. So uh, what do we do when things go wrong? So we just reviewed this. If you have a high CO2, you increase the IPAP or the breathing rate. If you have a low saturation, you increase the IPAP, EPAP, or sometimes if the pressures are too high, you can introduce oxygen to the circuit. If there's a persistent upper airway obstruction, uh, you can increase the EPAP. And if the EPAP is not tolerated well, it's too high, then you can increase the IPAP. And you should always think about triggering and dyssynchrony, which can usually be fixed by uh, changing the sensitivity and making sure the patient does not have a big mass leak. Positive initial encounter, child and caregivers engagement, ongoing education, sometimes peer support, especially for adolescents, and individualized strategies for adherents are very important to increase the use of BiPAP because, or CPAP, because the, uh, initially they're, all, honestly, they're only useful if the patients use it. Uh, and we, when we look at the uh, adherence, this is a study from France, you, we, we, shouldn't, we see that we shouldn't be discouraged because 72% of these patients use it for more than eight hours per night, and they use it almost for the whole month. Uh, the side effects are not major, but they are very important to take care because that's how you are going to keep the patient on the BiPAP. So heated humidification, saline drops, sometimes nasal steroids, changing masks, using well-fitting uh, masks are important. And also uh, maybe just uh, trying to use nasal masks uh, is very important again. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, emphasize this a couple of times. So how about the prognosis? Just a couple more slides and we'll go to the questions. So the prognosis of non-invasive ventilation uh, is usually similar to uh, invasive ventilation. So few patients can come off. So nine patients were able to discontinue ventilator support in this uh, cohort and 40% transition to adult care. Just uh, of interest, 55% of this cohort from England had neuromuscular disease. When we compare invasive to non-invasive ventilation in terms of survival and liberation rates, so patients who, who were on invasive ventilation had increased uh, morbidity uh, and mortality. So 85% of uh, cumulative survival, survival in the invasive ventilation group at five years compared to 97 in the non-invasive group. 
Again, a 10 year 77% survival compared to 97% in uh, non-invasive at 10 years. Of course, you know, these children have more uh, morbid diseases that have increased morbidity and mortality as well. And when they looked at the uh, liberation, you see that the patients uh, who did not have neuromuscular disease were more likely to be liberated. So this is a cumulative, cumulative percent liberated from uh, non-invasive uh, and invasive ventilation. And if you had a neuromuscular disease, you were less likely to be free of ventilation. Uh, at five and 10 years, because you know, neuromuscular diseases are uh, lifelong uh, diseases and usually progressive. And they are usually uh, associated with uh, sleep disorders. So the shams, for example, they may have both obstructive sleep apnea and hypoventilation and SMA hypoventilation and so forth. And especially in children with neuromuscular disease, as the FBC falls down, they have a progressive uh, respiratory failure from nocturnal hypoventilation to uh, during REM to non-REM sleep. And if the children with neuromuscular disease have decreased vital capacities, loss of ambulation, or if you have an infant weakness and neuromuscular disease, these are the children who need overnight monitorization. And I want to uh, just finish uh, about talking with one slide about talking the new technologies that we use for follow up of these patients who are on both invasive and non-invasive ventilation. This paper just recently came about uh, came out uh, and just reviews how to use non-invasive positive pressure device uh, downloads uh, because we can get great data both about usage and also about leaks apnea hypotenias, and uh, or if you're ventilating them invasively or non-invasively, you can uh, find out about the volumes triggering uh, and you can make your adjustments. Even without sleep studies, those are the things that we can use to help our patients. So this was my patient with congenital central hyperventilation who was um, discharged home when she was a baby with a tracheostomy. Now free of tracheostomy using non-invasive ventilation and diaphragm pacing. I think I will go to my questions for a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so the first question is, oops, sorry. Which of the following statements is not true for home mechanical ventilation in children? Children must be medically stable for discharge. Family caregivers must be willing and able to care for the patient. Monitoring with the use of ventilator alarms during sleep is sufficient. Ongoing education of the caregivers is recommended. Mechanical insufflation, exufflation device, so the cuff assist, is helpful to maintain airway patency. I think we can go to the uh, answer. Yes, so we need to monitor these children with a pulse oximetry, especially when they're sleeping and not uh, monitored by a person. Okay, so the next question is, which of the following statements is true for non-invasive ventilation in children? It's indicated in children with severe bulbar dysfunction, a well-fitting mask, addressing minor side effects and regular follow-up increase, increases compliance, oral nasal mask uh, and nasal mask carry similar risk for aspiration, increasing EPAP is effective for decreasing high CO2, Adding oxygen into the circuit improves synchrony. I think we can go to the question, uh, to the answers, please. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so we add the, uh, so the increasing EPAP is not the effective way, it's increasing the IPAP and the uh, rate uh, that improves the carbon dioxide levels. Which of the following is not an indication for an overnight sleep study in children with neuromuscular disorders? FVC less than 60% predicted, diaphragmatic weakness, children with symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, loss of ambulation because of progressive weakness, all children over four years of age. Okay, we can go to the answer. 
Yes, so uh, it's recommended by American Academy of Pediatrics that all children over four years of age uh, with Down syndrome need a sleep study for because it's so common in children with Down syndrome, but not, uh, of course, in children with uh, neuromuscular disease. Yep, so that's the end of my questions. Uh, I think I got some questions, Fabio. Yes, so thank you very much for your clear and complete presentation. And according to the uh, answer to your question, it seems to me that uh, uh, you are very clear. We have uh, uh, 10 minutes to answer to your question, and uh, we have quite a lot of questions. So we should start uh, right away. I will divide the question in, uh, with the first presentation and the second presentation. So the, uh, starting with the first presentation on uh, polysonography, uh, there is a question, if you have a child with OSAS, uh, where the diagnosis was made with polysonography, can you use polygraphy and pulse oximetry to monitoring the child? Yes, of course. So in ERS statement, which was different than the other uh, organization statement, that we uh, recommended an objective testing, and that can be either with polysonography, and if not available, polygraphy, uh, or oximetry. So oximetry, um, uh, oximetry is very sensitive, is very specific. So if it's positive, you can go ahead with the treatment. If it's negative, if, and if there's a high suspicion, uh, it may not, it may underestimate or it may uh, falsely say it's a negative study. So polygraphy is a, you know, looking, it's, it's a plus uh, looking at the airway, um, the airflow and also the uh, effort. So it, but polygraphy may underestimate or overestimate. So you may actually, if it's positive, you may actually be treating maybe more children, but it's not a lot more. So I would still recommend treatment. But if it's negative, it may underestimate because uh, you don't, uh, you're not uh, scoring some of the events that are associated with arousal. Uh, so if there's a high clinical suspicion, uh, then I would still go ahead with the treatment. Uh, so you can even recommend it that you can even use a questionnaire uh, as an objective diagnostic method. Okay, now there are two similar questions on uh, contraindication or restriction to polysonography. Uh, so there is no contraindication. Uh, there are some, um, you know, there are some tricks though. We did the polysonography recently on a baby who had a, a cranial surgery. So there was a opening of the flap because of the EEGs. EEG uh, probes, so that was a that was a sad event because the child had to go back to the OR for that. But you know, they sh the child actually had an EEG monitoring because you know sometimes you they require that. So it wasn't you know it was like a malpractice, but it was just something that we should have been maybe more uh, you know co co considerate. Uh, but other than that, there is no contraindication, of course. Uh, sorry, what was the other question? And the other question is uh, uh, on uh, central apnea, how worrying is CPAP treatment uh, to central apnea? And is the natural history that gets better without change to BPAP in a short while? Okay, so for central apnea, for example, in children with Pradarvilli uh, syndrome who have central apnea or younger children uh, who have uh, central apnea, there are some studies showing that oxygen therapy was effective uh, because it actually uh, corrects the underlying uh, physiology so that the overshooting and uh, overshooting after uh, apnea so that there's a uh, problem with the breathing stability and oxygen stabilizes that so it can be used uh, unless there is a hypoventilation so CPAP is not used for central apnea so it's either oxygen if it's useful and you need to monitor for CO2 levels uh, and make sure the child is stable on that or you need to give a rate. So you cannot even do a bypass with a spontaneous, right? So you can do a spontaneous time or a time bypass. Uh, so you need a rate because it's a central instability. You, you were mentioned uh, oxygen uh, for central apnea. There is a question, what is the role of supplementary oxygen for central apnea? Uh, 
So there are studies, we're actually now doing a, um, a, a multi-center study looking at this also, uh, putting our cases together. But there are some uh, studies showing that especially in Pradarvili and infants, uh, that you can use central apnea. So central apnea, oxygen central apnea is like a band-aid because you're not, you know, you're correcting the oxygen, but uh, it may also, like I said, improve the stability of breathing because you're not overshooting after an apnea because your oxygen is not as low. So your breathing is more stable. And this has been shown with, uh, this has been shown with sleep studies. Okay, another question. Do you have any experience or knowledge about asthma-induced hyperventilation in children? Okay, but this is a, not a sleep uh, issue though, right? So this can be, uh, you know, like a breathing, uh, dysfunctional breathing, hyperventilation, dysfunctional breathing can be associated with asthma, but um, not in the sleep lab context. Okay. And the other question, will type 3 polysonography sufficient for pediatric age group? So American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, published a recent review, maybe like over the last year or two, saying that it's not recommended. There are not enough studies looking at it. Uh, currently, we are uh, working on an ERS task force. There are eight studies in children uh, comparing polygraphy to polysonography. So it's not the perfect tool, it seems. Uh, we need more, maybe more studies looking what's working, what's not working. Uh, but especially now in the COVID times, I, I think we need more at home resources like, you know, since if I was uh, patients using uh, home spirometry, we are again doing a study right now with polygraphy, looking at the value. I definitely think it has a value. It just needs to be carefully assessed for each patient uh, and we clearly need to do better with our studies. Okay, then there is another question. If you see a high central apnea, hypapnea index during polysonography, what evaluation is recommended? Narrow imaging or genetic testing for congenital central hypapnea syndrome? Okay, perfect. So we, unfortunately, I did not go into central apnea, but uh, so patients in adults, they don't even differentiate between obstructive or central apnea. They just say AHI. In children, we do differentiate because we have diseases that are associated with central hypopnea syndrome. So one of the things that we need to be you know, mindful of, if there are a lot of obstructive events also, there are some uh, studies now in children showing improvement of central apnea after treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, even in Down syndrome. So that's something that we need to be mindful of. And second, if we do not have a good reason and we see a central apnea index of greater than five, then uh, you, know, you need to look at the context. There can be patients who have central, uh, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome with milder presentations. So I would do both. Uh, definitely neuroimaging, so uh, that's recommended uh, because you can have a Chiari malformation or other central uh, abnormalities uh, and also genetic testing for hypoventilation syndromes. So we just have another, we, ha we have a recent patient who have a hypoventilation and we just discovered like a novel gene for a hypoventilation. So it, not just congenital central hypoventilation, but others as well. Okay. And also we had, there is another question. With regards to grading the severity of OSAS, I feel the OSA with hyperventilation should be termed the most severe form, but the ERS paper states that the step before OSA, is it right for you? Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard to compare a patient who has, let's say, you know, 30 uh, apnea hypopnea index per hour, is it more severe or hypoventilation is more severe? I think it's a different uh, severity uh, and definitely contributes to the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. And sometimes if you treat the obstructive sleep apnea, that improves as well uh, with adenotonsillectomy. But if it doesn't, it definitely has a lot of treatment implications, right? So you may not be able to treat it with a CPAP alone, you may need a non-invasive ventilation with a BiPAP. Okay, we have time just for two questions on the second uh, presentation, then uh, you can answer to the uh, to this uh, with the chat. So the first one, how wide 
can, uh, can be the differential pressure in invasive and non-invasive ventilation? Mm -hmm. So there, there is no upper limit uh, to my knowledge. Uh, you just need to make sure you have enough PEEP uh, so that if you think PEEP is enough, uh, then you can go you know, as much pressure as you'd like. But then if you are, you're gonna have to use you know, very high pressures, be mindful of the uh, bar trauma. And then maybe that's the time to use the IVAPs uh, or AVAPs, so the volume assured, because maybe a patient needs, especially during sleep, maybe during RAM sleep, a little bit more pressure and during non-RAM sleep, a little bit less pressure, which and the uh, other, other is true for CCHS. Uh, they may need less pressure during a RAM sleep so that you're mindful of uh, you know, the pressures you're giving to the patient. Okay, so now we have the last question uh, that is just a small case. I have a patient born preterm, presently on uh, 45 weeks post uh, conceptual age now, is dependent on high flow nasal cannula at a FIO2 of 21% using RAM cannula, being treated as PBD, but we have not investigated for tracheomalacia. The question is can home CPAP therapy be useful for the patient? So I would definitely investigate that child for lower airway abnormalities, uh, including tracheomalacia. And uh, so yes, currently it's hard to discharge patients with high flow nasal cannula. There are some studies looking at it. It's very expensive and not as practical. Uh, home CPAP can be an option for this baby for sure. But um, there are limits, uh, there are limits for um, weight for home uh, devices usually. So the patient had to be, has to be like at a certain weight, weight before uh, can be transitioned to the home machine and then can be sent home. Okay, so I'm sorry that uh, we have no time for the other uh, question, but I'm sure that uh, Refika will uh, use the chat to answer to the other uh, question. And I think that we can close uh, this long, long day uh, I think that we did very well because we are exactly on time and uh, I hope to see all you again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock for the second uh, day of the summer school. Thank you very much.